Welcome, everybody. Thanks for your patience. My name is Chris DeFay, and I'm a member of the Authors at Google team here in Santa Monica. On behalf of the team, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Seth Jones, a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation. He most recently served as the representative for the commander, U.S. Special Operations Command, to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations. He specializes in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, with a particular focus on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Al Qaeda. Jones is the author of In the Graveyard of Empires, America's War in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, as well as numerous other publications. The title of his talk today is After Bin Laden, the United States, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Please join me in welcoming Seth Jones. Just want to thank uh, Google for uh, putting this uh, project together. What I'd like to do is, in light of the um, uh, killing of bin Laden about a month ago in Abbottabad, Pakistan, take a moment right now to look at what the organization looks like right now. Uh, look historically at uh, uh, efforts to target uh, Al Qaeda over the past several years, and then look at the uh, battle going on across the uh, Muslim world right now about uh, ideas, um, about what, what the ideology is right now and how it's being received in a range of various places, especially with some of the uh, uh, developments more recently in the Arab Spring in Egypt, Libya, and a range of other locations. So I'll start off by looking right now at the structure of Al-Qaeda. Um, what most people don't often understand in looking at Al-Qaeda is that in many ways it is structured like a business in, in one sense. It has a uh, central or core node that is uh, primarily located in Pakistan. That's your inner circle here, uh, where in that sense it has a leader, uh, now uh, uh, tentatively Ayman al-Zawahiri. Uh, then it has a, a range of committees or shuras that uh, primarily focus on key parts of uh, the organization finances, it needs money to operate, it's propaganda, it needs a, a, a media element, and it has uh, TV, uh, a Sahab media, it's got uh, a range of other publications. Um, in addition, it's got a religious uh, committee or shura, it's got a military shura that gets involved in everything from training to conducting operations in specific theaters like Pakistan, Afghanistan as well as uh, overseas in Europe and the United States. Uh, and then it's got a number of other committees that deal with uh, more logistical parts of any organization. As you take a step outward, it also has a range of what you might call affiliated groups. And these are groups that actually have a direct tie to Al-Qaeda. They have generally renamed themselves over the years. We have Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula based out of Yemen. We have Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, based out of uh, North Africa. We've got Al-Qaeda East Africa, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, uh, and uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates in several other places. Uh, but they have, a, they have a direct relationship, and in a sense, they look to Pakistan for some uh, strategic guidance, in some cases, uh, other things like training, uh, finances, if they need it. Uh, a, f a third circle is uh, ally groups. These are groups that are not affiliated, that is, they're not part of Al-Qaeda itself directly, but they may cooperate uh, in, in various locations. So that would include groups like Lashkari Taiba, Tariki Taliban Pakistan, uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, which is actually somewhere in between an affiliate and an allied group. And then you get, in addition, as you keep going, in, to the, uh, uh, an, an additional ring here, you get affiliates. These are not groups per se, they're not structured like a group, they don't have a hierarchy of leaders, but they're cells or nodes in a range of cases. So for example, the plotters that were involved in uh, uh, the, the London bombing in 2005 were a small cell in Britain that connected directly to core Al-Qaeda in Pakistan and then perpetrated an attack uh, on the underground in London. Uh, Finally, we have uh, the inspired networks, the outer ring. These are individuals who have no connection at all other than uh, they may be on uh, websites, uh, shared uh, forums. Um, they may simply read material and are inspired to uh, conduct actions. So in the United States, we've had a range of uh, groups like this. Uh, the Fort Dix plot in 2007 
was done by a range of, in this case, Albanians that had been simply inspired by, uh, among other individuals, Anwar Alalaki, one of the senior figures in Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, to conduct a range of attacks at U.S. military installations in uh, New Jersey, including at Fort Dix. So, Al Qaeda now is, as you see here, really a range of different things, from a core structure to simply inspired individuals. And what's been interesting over the years is looking at how various elements of this have used social media to push out messages and to recruit individuals. So what is the structure uh, trying to do? Well, most of the organization and its affiliates still looks towards establishing something along the lines of a caliphate. Um, that is overthrowing, overthrowing regimes across the Arab world all the way probably up to about Pakistan realistically. There have been Al Qaeda elements in the Philippines, for example, that have been um, uh, in Southeast Asia that have been interested in overthrowing a range of regimes, Indonesia. Uh, but the bulk of the effort really exists in an axis from, um, uh, from about uh, uh, Libya through uh, the Arabian Peninsula and to Pakistan and, and perhaps parts of India and south through Yemen. Key individuals uh, in the group right now, with the death of Osama bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahiri, who has probably been the most important ideological um, uh, individual pushing out messages, has generally taken over as the uh, most important senior official right now. Uh, but you also see a range of individuals across the uh, Muslim world that, uh, in, uh, that have important uh, components. So. Uh, I'll take Anwar Alalaki, for example. He's one of the senior officials. Uh, you, at the bottom of the screen, you, he, he's, he's getting somewhat cut off here. Uh, but Alaki is important because what he's done, really better than anybody else across Al Qaeda, is he has uh, reached out to Facebook, he's reached out to the internet more broadly, and he's reached out towards multiple forums to get messages out. He's downloaded. Um, a range of uh, sermons that he has given. And what we found over the past several years, just in looking at um, attacks and plots, is that simply by getting the message out, by speaking to individuals simply over the internet, it has inspired attacks in a range of locations. Uh, uh, communication has also done that. So in the United States, um, Alaki was in direct contact with Major Hassan, who was involved in two, late 2009 in the Fort Hood shootings in the United States, uh, directly via email. So what we see with sort of a new generation of Al-Qaeda leaders is they have migrated towards the social media, uh, both to recruit individuals, but also to push out their propaganda. And it's really been an effective use of the internet, downloading videos on YouTube, uh, where anybody across the world, assuming it's not blocked, can download. Um, any uh, Alaki is downloadable on YouTube, as are a range of other uh, leaders. What I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time in looking at uh, uh, some of the efforts against Al Qaeda. Uh, just for time purposes, we'll focus mostly on a couple cases um, that have affected the United States, and then I want to spend a little bit of time looking at uh, some of the struggles within Islam over ideas, uh, much of which actually is taking place using social media. Uh, there are, since 2001, there have been multiple uh, uh, homeland plots in the United States, many of which have not gotten much public attention. But I want to focus on a couple here. The first one is uh, in 2006. A uh, couple of individuals uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, they were British Pakistanis, Assad Sawar, Ahmed Ali Khan, and Tanvir Hussein were involved was a slightly broader network, were involved in conducting militant training in Pakistan, had been given instructions and orders to conduct a, uh, uh, a, a uh, bombing on 10 different uh, airlines coming from Heathrow Airport uh, to the United States. Some were going to Canada, including Montreal. Some uh, were likely going to other cities, San Francisco, Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York City. 
Uh, and what they had uh, done, and this is why we use, uh, this is why we have to, uh, uh, our, our quantities of liquids are limited when we get on airplanes today. What they had done is taken bottles of essentially Gatorade equivalents, uh, Lucasade and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and other sports drinks, uh, emptied out the liquids from them and put in a uh, mixture of uh, ingredients uh, that, uh, that were explosives. They were using TATP, uh, and the uh, the idea, and they were quite along, uh, quite far along in the plotting, was that uh, each of these individuals would bring bottles of Lucasade uh, through security at the airport in Heathrow, uh, which uh, they they actually were correct in noting that they would have been able to get on quite easily through security, and then uh, as they approached uh, either American or or uh, Canadian airspace. Uh, detonated and destroyed the airplanes. Uh, the idea was to to, uh, to to do ten of them at the same time. Now, what was quite important in looking at the efforts against them, this is primarily led by British intelligence, its domestic intelligence agency, MI5, and Metropolitan Police, that's the New Scotland Yard. Uh, they had been monitoring a range of individuals involved in uh, suspicious books bookshops in Forest Gate, East London, uh, were part of investigations on on a uh, an, an attack uh, the year uh, the the year earlier. So, uh, plus they'd been monitoring a range of Al Qaeda operatives in the UK, which led them eventually to this particular cell. Then they launched a massive police and intelligence uh, covert effort, involving uh, bugging houses that they were building the bombs, searching luggage as they traveled. Uh, and, and in particular, what was interesting is reaching out to the Muslim community across the UK for help in identifying these individuals, uh, but uh, more importantly, um, arguing very strongly that, that this was a British effort to target a handful of terrorists that were bent on uh, conducting attacks. This was certainly not something that was done against uh, Islam or Muslim com uh, communities across, uh, across the uh, UK. Uh, so at, at that point then, uh, they, they, by August of 2006, through fairly covert uh, clandestine efforts, uh, they had enough information to conduct a series of arrests at a fairly advanced stage. They were actually quite close to um, moving, the, they'd identified the airplanes, uh, which they were going to take uh, the Lucasade on, and then uh, uh, took most of these individuals down, key elements, including Assad Sarwar, Ahmed Ali Khan and Tanvir Hussein were all uh, prosecuted and uh, are, are in uh, British prison. That was a case where we had uh, Al Qaeda involved from Pakistan in directly a, 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 at the strategic, operational, and planning level involved in that operation. In fact, um, the, the key Al Qaeda uh, individual involved at that point was a guy named Rashid Rauf, uh, who was a uh, British Pakistani who was in Pakistan at the time and was actually involved in directing the operation um, while they were putting the bombs together. They were in daily communication with him over the internet uh, uh, and over, uh, over cell phones and through text messages on the composition of ingredients to, to put on the airplanes. Now this one was a very effective effort, I think, to foil that plot, but it, what it shows is I think two things. One is most of the efforts against Al Qaeda, these are direct threats to the West, have generally not involved large presences of military forces overseas. What they've required is really covert, clandestine efforts and support from communities. I want to shift to another interesting case that I think highlights this, but in a different respect. This is the Fort Dix plot from May 2007. These are uh, New Jersey plotters who radicalized in part, as I said earlier, by listening to uh, The Constants of Jihad by Anwar al-Awlaki, who was educated uh, from college uh, at, in Colorado, spent time living in San Diego and a range of other locations, is now in Yemen. Uh, but, but through a radicalization process, these individuals from just outside Philadelphia in southern New Jersey plotted to kill U.S. soldiers, including at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Now in this case, the, the key in undermining the plot was actually good, what you might call good community outreach. Um, 
the uh, plotters had taken video uh, of uh, uh, training exercises in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania and had um, uh, brought it to Circuit City to get a transition from 8 millimeter to uh, DVD. And the uh, clerk, Brian Morgan Stern at Circuit City, who is doing the conversion, noticed something a little odd, uh, a range of individuals shouting Allahu Akbar and um, shooting AK-47s in the Pocono. So he alerted law enforcement, who then alerted the FBI, who then used, in this case, clandestinely two informants, pushed them into the cell, monitored their efforts, and uh, uh, ultimately convicted these individuals uh, in a uh, what was a pretty serious plot against uh, uh, several U.S. military facilities. So again, we see covert clandestine presence um, and uh, good work, in this case from law enforcement within a uh, within the community. This is this is just a, an an individual who, uh, from Circuit City, concerned citizen who took the time to identify a problem and then call uh, call local uh, uh, authorities. The final one is an individual named uh, Najibul Azazi. This was probably unbeknownst to most people today, the closest the, the U.S. has come in the last several years to a core Al-Qaeda attack. Zazi had radicalized uh, while he was living in New York, in Flushing, New York, near uh, Shea Stadium, near JFK Airport, had gone to Pakistan in late 2008 for uh, actually to fight with the Taliban, uh, had been recruited by uh, an Al-Qaeda operative and then had been brought down to training camps in North Waziristan uh, and South Waziristan, among other things where he met with senior Al-Qaeda leaders. He met with Salih al-Somali, who is the head of external operations, Rashid Ralph, and then somebody who had spent a fair amount of time in Florida, Adnan al uh where they had taken these individuals, convinced them that it would be more appropriate not to fight with the Taliban in Afghanistan, but to conduct a, an attack back in the United States. So they went through brief training, Zazi in particular, who you see in the photograph here, went through a brief training on how to build bombs. Um, he took shooting courses as well. It's a pretty small training camp in South Waziristan. Uh, he, was, he, he left uh, fr uh, Pakistan, went back to the United States in January of 2009 at which point he started uh, the uh, actual uh, operational part of the plan. Uh, he moved to Colorado where he built his bombs, tested them in, um, uh, in Colorado, including putting the ingredients together at a hotel. Uh, not until September, through monitoring an email account from an Al-Qaeda operative, was it discovered uh, how far along it was. In fact, what's interesting about this plot is when U.S. and British agencies identified the plot itself. They were two weeks away from the actual attack. So I can just step back for a second. Two weeks before the attack had actually occurred, uh, that plot was identified. So U.S. law enforcement at that point had two weeks to pull together information to stop what was going to be a, uh, three suicide bombers on three different, likely three different subway uh, cars in New York City uh, in late September at the end of Ramadan in 2009. Through that intercepted email and the surveillance um, and actually help from the local community in New York, that plot was identified and, uh, and the individuals were arrested Zazi ended up pleading guilty and, and actually publicly divulged uh, the entire uh, plan. But what's important, I think, in looking at this is several things. One is, is the threat was actually quite serious. I mean, again, this was two weeks away from an actual attack in, in New York City that went up to the head of external operations for Al-Qaeda. It was very close to an attack, and that was uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, last year, there was another uh, near attack that involved Faisal Shahzad in New York City. This was not an Al-Qaeda attack, it was a different group, the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan. But he placed a, a car bomb in New York City, uh, actually did everything, built it, went through training also in Pakistan, 
uh, got the bomb into Times Square on a Saturday night, uh, exactly where he wanted, parked it across the street from a uh, New York City uh, police car, and then detonated. The bomb malfunctioned, didn't go off, uh, but tests afterward of that kind of of that kind of bomb had it worked, and the detonator in particular worked, uh, would have uh, killed a large number of people in Times Square on a Saturday night. So part of this issue is, as we look at Al-Qaeda, what we've seen is a couple of things, if I can take a step back. If we go back to the earlier slides, what we're seeing is some plots, as we look, look to the post-Bin Laden era, uh, some plots that will likely emanate from Al-Qaeda based on uh, a plotting against the United States and the West, uh, other plots, as we've seen, that have gone back to Anwar al-Awlaki uh, in Yemen. Uh, others that may be inspired by simply ally groups or inspired networks. But I think uh, as there is a danger of, with the death of bin Laden, I think, in, in getting lulled into thinking that, uh, that the United States, the West in general, or any of its allied countries have somehow uh, made it into the clear uh, and don't face a serious threat from terrorism. I think as the uh, last two years in particular demonstrates, uh, there is a, an extremely serious threat. And in fact, in the case of Faisal Shahzad, as well as Umar Farooq Abdul Mutalab, who uh, tried to detonate a bomb on a Northwest Airlines flight from Amsterdam to Detroit in, on Christmas Day 2009, he got the bomb on the plane he attempted to detonate, the bomb didn't go off, uh, but uh, in, that, in that case it went back to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Awlaki again. Um, the threat is serious uh, from most of these individuals. What I'd like to do, in addition to looking at some of the ways that a lot of, this, uh, a lot of the plots have been foiled, again, working with local communities um, and good intelligence and uh, police efforts, is understanding a little bit about the debates going on within Islam. Uh, something I think that's probably not entirely understood, certainly not in the United States, but uh, Al-Qaeda does not, uh, is, still remains, including in conservative circles, as a radical fringe group. And one of the more interesting elements is uh, one of the founders of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, its first leader, very good friend of what Al-Qaeda's leader now, Ayman al-Zawahiri, uh, uh, and someone who had been involved in previous uh, attacks in Egypt, published a book in, in uh, 2007 where if he officially broke with Al-Qaeda. And among other things, he had become, and, and over, the, over the last several years, had become increasingly opposed to civilian casualties caused by Al-Qaeda in places like Iraq. Uh, so his book, Rationalizing Jihad in Egypt, very strongly argued, and this is coming from somebody, A, who is a very significant um, individual in Egyptian Islamic Jihad, B, was a close friend of the senior al-Qaeda leadership, but three, was a very important strategic thinker, strongly condemns in the harshest terms what al-Qaeda has become. So you begin to see spurred by this effort, a real serious debate that happens, among other places, online, across the Arab world. Um, again, on, on uh, you can see it on YouTube, Facebook, a range of different social media, as well as jihadi websites. Is it moral to kill civilians? Uh, and as we see here, just to see, uh, to note one of uh, Sharif's quotes, uh, blowing up of hotels, buildings, and public transportation is not permitted. Another one, there is nothing that invokes the anger of God and his wrath like the unwarranted spilling of blood and wrecking of property. This is partly a response to the massive brutality of car bombs killing large numbers of civilians in places like Iraq. Uh, in addition to that, we've seen a range of other uh, opposing voices. Um, Sheikh Salman bin Fad al Auda, Sheikh Yusuf al Karadawi. These are entrenched um, individuals who have uh, strong Islamic credentials that have taken on Al Qaeda on religious grounds. Um, and among other things, have pointed out that individuals that I mentioned earlier, Anwar al Awlaki, uh, one of the senior leaders of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, no religious 
um, no, no religious credentials, never went to Al-Azhar University in Saudi Arabia. In fact, was arrested twice in San Diego for soliciting prostitutes in the uh, uh, early 1990s. Not exactly, uh, a, uh, uh, not exactly a behavior that would be uh, consistent with a, an, an Al-Qaeda leader. Um, others, including Adnan al Shukrajuma, who was involved in the, uh, uh, the Zazi plot that I mentioned earlier, was arrested in Broward County, Florida, for beating up girls, young girls. They were actually his sisters, but he was arrested for uh, battery. So part of what we've seen, and this is uh, Alauda talking here, is the former spiritual mentor of Osama bin Laden. Incidents such as the Fort Hood shooting, this is the one I mentioned earlier with uh, Major Hassan, have bad consequences, and undoubtedly this man might have a psychological problem. The last paragraph, how much blood has been spilled? How many innocent children, women, and old people have been killed, maimed, and expelled from their homes in the name of Al-Qaeda? I think what we've seen as we look at countering a group that has conducted attacks, it did uh, September 11, 2001, it was involved in a range of others, including the London bombings uh, in 2005, which has come very close to uh, attacks recently, and most recently 2009 in the United States from the core elements, and then uh, uh, even more recently in 2010 with the cargo plane plots that was tied back to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. There are a couple of things that stand out, I think, as we look at the, uh, at the last uh, several years of countering Al-Qaeda. One is that uh, that there is an important component of counter-radicalization. That is, understand grievances that are causing individuals to radicalize, actually to, to, from Muslim communities across the West and, um, and across the Arab world, to go from uh, being unhappy about events, U.S. wars in a range of places, the plight of Palestinians, to then than using violence. It's an important shift, but one that, that has got to be looked at very carefully. And as part of that, delegitimizing the group's ideology, as we have started to see from a range of very conservative but legitimate Sunni and Shia leaders, uh, that, that, that this is probably at its core a war of ideas, not a battlefield uh, uh, struggle, but a war of ideas. In many ways, probably like the uh, struggle during the Cold War between Western views of democracy and communism. Second, though, there does need to be an effort of uh, 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 intelligence. I think one of the things that is pretty clear to me is uh, uh, this is not about sending large numbers of forces overseas, including U.S. forces overseas. This is really a role of uh, police and intelligence agencies, uh, including ones that are working with local communities to understand concerns and to help identify uh, individuals uh, that are fringe individuals that are plotting attacks, uh, including cases like the 9-11 attacks that are killing Muslims. And then finally, um, there are efforts on the financial front um, and others to uh, weaken a group's ability to function. That's been done in a range of areas. But I want to come back to the struggle for ideas because it's a very important one as I wrap up. And, and I want to quote from now the head of Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri. He wrote a note which was uh, captured uh, in 2005 to the head at the time of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And he says to Al-Qaeda in Iraq leaders, I say to you, he's writing this from Pakistan, I say to you that we are in a battle, and more than half of this battle is in the battlefield of the media. And again, the media today obviously is not just one on print, but even more importantly, on the internet, uh, social media, that we are in a media battle in a race for the hearts and minds of our ummah, and that however far our capabilities reach, they will never be equal to one thousandth of the capabilities of the kingdom of Satan that is waging war on us. What's important to recognize here is how, how much of this struggle is actually taking place uh, in the realm of ideas. And I think what will be important over time is to legitimately respond to this fringe thinking, this fringe thinking that thinks it's okay to conduct attacks against civilians and to push back on it, uh, that it is illegitimate 
it is certainly contrary to basic Islam, um, and that it is, it is uh, contrary to basic human dignity. So with that, I will conclude and turn this over to questions. Any questions? Let's, let's get it on then. So since it's a media battle, um, and you mentioned the guy from Circuit City who helped out by saying, oh, this is suspicious behavior. Uh, would you say that things like the security theater we have at airports is actively harmful to us fighting Al Qaeda? Because it both causes people to be less likely to report suspicious behavior because everything is suspicious. And it also causes people to be less trustful of the government if they're coming up with regulations that seem ridiculous? That's a, that's a good question. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is that many of the more, more recent plots, transatlantic one I mentioned earlier, the airplanes plot in December of 2009, have involved bringing uh, a range of innovative bombs onto airplanes and taking them down. So the challenge we all face, I think everybody faces, uh, as members of the public is is concerns about intrusive uh, technologies with, frankly, a realistic concern about bombs. I and mean, if you look at the underwear bomber uh, in uh, 2009, um, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab, the Nigerian, who had radicalized, gone through training in Yemen, not Pakistan, but in Yemen. And, and uh, the bomb that uh, senior Yemeni bomb maker put together for him was hidden in his underwear. Uh, he didn't actually, including the detonator, uh, did not have metal on it, so it, wasn't, it wouldn't have been picked up by a uh, metal detector. Uh, and the way he was going to detonate it was through a syringe that was, uh, it was, it was a TATP bomb. Uh, the syringe uh, added a component to, a, uh, to the TATP, which would have exploded uh, the bomb on board. So he had gone to, he had, he had worn it through actually multiple um, airports. And he'd actually, the, the original flight that he was on was uh, from Amsterdam to the United States, but he had come from, ultimately from Yemen. So he had gone through multiple, ra through, uh, multiple detectors. So the, the problem that I'm getting at is uh, a range of groups, in this case, in Al Qaeda in, in the Arabian Peninsula, have figured out vulnerabilities in the system and have decided taking down an airplane not only is a legitimate target, but is also has major vulnerabilities. Uh, and they've designed bombs to get through metal detectors, which I think is why there have been efforts to try and, from a technological end, uh, come up with countermeasures. So th th there is definitely a trade-off, but I will tell you there's a rationale for doing something more than just a, a straight-up metal detector just because uh, that clearly failed in the Abdul Mutalab case, and the same kind of bomb would make it right through a, a, a generic metal detector at an airport. I think that's the that's that's the challenge. Thanks. Thanks. I wanted to ask you about security um, for trains. Uh, after um, they discovered the intelligence in uh, in Bin Laden's uh, hideout. Uh, they said that some of it indicated they were planning attacks on trains, uh, major attacks on trains. And so there's not really, so I, I, not recently, but I guess about two and a half years ago, I, was, I took a train from D.C. to New York, and there's no security at all. You just take whatever you want directly on the train. Uh, they don't even check if you have a ticket until you're already on the train. They don't uh, check your bags. They do nothing. Uh, I don't know if that's changed. I haven't heard anything in the news about increasing security on, on trains. And when I had a discussion with someone, they said, oh, it's because you can't hijack a train and um, you know, crash it into a skyscraper. But a lot of these plots are just to blow up train, uh, blow up planes. And I think blowing up trains with people on them, you know, that's a, uh, an attack that obviously is being planned. So why is there no additional security on trains? That's a that's that's a that's a good question. The uh, and and just to be clear, um, if you look at the last ten years, a range of 
some of the successful attacks in Madrid in 2004, in London in 2005, were on trains. Uh, the uh, Madrid attack was multiple attacks uh, against uh, trains coming into the Atocha train station. Uh, the London attacks were three different tube trains and then a uh, double-decker bus. So there are clear vulnerabilities. The Najibullah attack, uh, the, the plot that I mentioned earlier in New York City would have been on, likely have been on the subway. Um, there have been efforts to increase security on trains. Uh, and Amtrak has recently made statements of um, both on the technological end, but also uh, other efforts to increase security. Uh, but I would say uh, two things. Um, one is the best way to foil most of these plots historically is not at the last minute. So in other words, if it gets to the point where somebody's walking in to a train station with a bomb, it's almost too late at that point. Uh, what's been clear with most recent plots, especially with ones that have been foiled, is there have always been opportunities to get information about the plots well in advance. Um, good dialogue with communities, um, good law enforcement and, and intelligence monitoring uh, should get, and in all cases, even with successful attacks, uh, there have been errors on the intelligence side in monitoring information. Or there are individuals who were given a warning in the case of uh, Abdul Mutalab in, uh, in the, the uh, 2009 um, airplane bombing. Uh, his father had tipped off American authorities that his son had radicalized. He was never put on, on the no-fly list. So there were mistakes that were made uh, along the way. The point here is is that it is important to protect and increase security measures, both on trains like Amtrak, but also subways. And there have been measures. But ultimately, with those public locations, there will always be some vulnerabilities. I think the more important part is also, or at least just as important, is the back end of this whole thing. Um, uh, are you, because, w again, with most of the American plots, the target may be in a city like New York or Washington. But as we've seen, the bombs are generally made elsewhere. Uh, Colorado, Colorado, Aurora, Colorado, outside of Denver for the Zazi. Uh, Connecticut for the Faisal Shazad attack. So that just means, among other things, that there's got to be uh, awareness and good community relations in identifying it well before it actually gets to that uh, final attack. But there always will be vulnerabilities in a free society, I think, uh, like ours. And again, while there have been improvements on uh, train security, it, it will never be foolproof, which is, I think, what, what pushes me to say uh, that just means it's, it's critical to identify these plots well before they get to that stage. Just, uh, sorry, I, I want to follow up this. You had the answer to the, airport, the question about security for airplanes was, that, well, it's, it's tricky because these measures that they're taking could have prevented past attacks like uh, the bom um, underwear bomber. But then the answer about trains is, well, there's always going to be vulnerabilities and it's kind of too late if you're trying to stop it at that point. So let me ask it a different way. Um, why is there a disparity between the security for air airplanes, which is uh, run by the uh, transportation, whatever it's called, uh, you know, government run and with uh, metal detectors and uh, scanners and, and all the, uh, as you call it, security theater. And I think that's from, uh, what's his name, Bruce uh, something. Uh, anyway, why is there a disparity between that and what and the security for trains, which is virtually non-existent? Why well, is disparity? I think the uh, part of the challenge is one of uh, uh, pragmatism. There are a finite number of airports in the United States. When you look at, for example, train stations, so you start including subways, um, bus stations, uh, because again, buses are also vulnerable. Uh, subway stations, train stations, bus stations, you're talking about an enormous number of possible locations that I think would, especially in the economic conditions we're at right now, uh, would 
I mean, the, the government would be broken uh, if it had to put those kinds of measures everywhere. So, uh, so in other words, what you can do, I think, is stem some vulnerable spots, and then, uh, you know, you're going to have to rely on good intelligence, law enforcement, uh, community for everything else. So, small number, fairly small number of airports, a huge number of train, subway, and bus stations. Um, and, and again, if, if you look at the uh, Israeli case, again, to add buses to your uh, train plot, uh, there have been and continue to be bus bombings in, in Israel. Uh, it's, at that point, it becomes very difficult to stop when you start expanding it to, uh, to, those, to all public infrastructure. So some, it's, uh, it, it probably makes financial sense to do but everything becomes, I think, uh, unwieldy and extraordinarily expensive. Okay, a uh, quick question for you. So, um, you, I mean, one of the key points of your talk is, is you know, the power of social media. And um, so, I guess, what are the specific things that, uh, you know, security agencies, police force, and so on can do with social media to sort of, like, I guess, uh, get something from Al-Qaeda? And then, um, on the opposite side of things, I guess, what are the good elements of social media that uh, that permit a free society to sort of like for people to exercise their freedoms, um, recognizing that you know there's people who are going to use it uh, in ways that are antagonistic to freedoms? I mean, I I think in general on the social media front, when it comes to uh, the government in general, actually what's m ideal is uh, limited involvement. I mean, I think what needs to happen and, and what has not happened in general, certainly not with the uh, American public, is a better understanding of the debates happening in other parts of the world. That is ensuring that that stuff is translated, uh, because a lot of those debates may be happening in Arabic across the Arab world. Um, strong pushback against Al Qaeda. I think governments trying to get too involved in that stuff uh, ends up actually being counterproductive. But I do think elevating those discussions so that everybody can see, and that you know, in, in some ways, it is useful, I think, along social media to discredit some of the key Al-Qaeda leaders. I mean, as I said earlier, a lot of people have been inspired by Anwar al-Awlaki. Uh, he's the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, uh, Peninsula radical, been involved in multiple plots in the United States, uh, inc including the successful Hassan attack. Uh, he was arrested twice in the United States for soliciting prostitutes. I mean, this is not, this is not, and he, he's, he has never been to any religious institution, yet he passes himself off as a, as a cleric. So uh, I think actually making that information available so that one could see his arrest records uh, would be useful, because that's not even publicly available. But just seeing the kinds of individuals we're talking about would be helpful. Shukra Juma, I mean, his involvement in beating up his sisters in, uh, um, in Broward County, Florida, that, most of that documentation is not available. I mean, that should be available. Uh, it should be available on social media. Yeah, I had a question um, that was related to the, to the book, I guess. A couple times you've said that uh, one thing that's <clears throat> that some of these plots have, have um, had in common is that they've been broken up by more, uh, I don't know, more well-informed police and intelligence work and had very little to do with, um, you know, soldiers from the, from the United States being in Afghanistan. I was wondering if you, um, if you think that there's, like what relationship do you, do you think there is between soldiers from the United States and other countries in Afghanistan and some of these plots. Like, um, you know, you hear in the news there's there's an occasional terrorist plot that's broken up, but there's very frequent reports of, you know, this wedding being hit by U.S. bombs and, you know, these civilians being killed by this or that mistaken action. I mean, it seems to me like some of those things may be related to the to the plots that, um, that we're seeing get broken up or in some cases go through successfully. What's your yeah, I mean, if, 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 if I understand your, your question uh, correctly, I mean, part of the, the important issue to look at is what's leading to radicalization uh, and it's driving people to get involved in some of these plots. 
Um, certainly one of the biggest issues that has come up historically with al-Qaeda is just a, a Western presence at all. I mean, what, what got bin Laden so angry and pushed him over the edge was the involvement of U.S. forces in pushing back Iraq in the first Gulf War when Iraq invaded um, Kuwait. Uh, after that, though, with some of these, and what radicalizes some uh, individuals is very different. So it's hard to overgeneralize. But it tends to be, um, it tends to be when you look at, and, and with, with, with most of the plotters that I talked about earlier, there is now a track record of why they radicalized. So with Zazi, it was, among other things, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, that radicalized him. He was concerned about uh, what he perceived as Israeli occupation and a U.S. relationship with Israel. Um, in a few cases, it's been uh, have, uh, some of the perceived atrocities, Abu Ghraib, that's, uh, those images have, have been pushed around on social media that have uh, uh, radicalized individuals. Um, several images from Iraq in general have been pushed out on, on social media, including sent around on CDs and DVDs to radicalize individuals, but it's done in a context of a worldview that, uh, that is still a sort of a fringe group. So what they've done is they've taken uh, U.S. or British or other involvement overseas and taken images from it, but then put it into a broader context of the need to create a, a, a uh, caliphate uh, and establish their version of Sharia law in a range of countries from North Africa all the way to Pakistan and, and, and potentially Southeast Asia. So yes, they will highlight certain, in the radicalization process, individuals will latch on to different things some cases it may be in the Israeli-Palestinian context, in some cases it may be the Iraq context, in some cases it may be uh, Afghanistan, in some cases it may be the Saudi government, the Egyptian government. Uh, I mean, it, it, it varies quite a bit. I think you actually answered a bit of my question, which was, or a bit of one of them, which was sort of what things are, are the the grievances that we would need to address. <clears throat> and so another question I had was you had mentioned that um, a lot of these plots have been foiled by intelligence and that kind of stuff, and there have been tips that have been, and some of them have been tips that have been ignored and that kind of thing. But I was also wondering if we get a lot of tips that are <clears throat> um, just not, don't lead anywhere, and so kind of how much noise is there, you know, because it's easy to point out, well, we had this guy said this about that guy, and this guy said this about that guy, and we ignored it, and, and he got away, right? But we don't know, this guy said this about that guy, and there was nothing there. He was, it was the same harassment as like turning your neighbor into the IRS because you don't like their lawn or whatever, you know? So, so how much of that kind of goes on? How much, how much noise is there in those signals that we supposedly ignored? Uh, there's an extraordinary amount of noise. I'll just give you one example. Um, one of Al-Qaeda's uh, mid-level Propagandists is, is an American from Winchester, California, uh, not too far from here. Uh, he radicalized, his, his father is uh, Jewish, his mother came from a Christian family. He grew up in a Christian household, converted to Islam in Orange County, California, and then uh, uh, radicalized, went over to Pakistan, um, joined Al Qaeda. He's been spotted many times over the last several years in various places in the United States, none of which has been true because he's been in Pakistan the whole time. But there have been thousands and thousands of reports as his name gets put on an FBI terrorist watch list, and you can download it from the FBI's website. So there are pictures of Adam Gadan. Uh, and there have been thousands and th tens of thousands of tips that he's been spotted. He was spotted at Circuit City in New Jersey, the one that Adam Morgenstern had reported the Fort Dix plotters. He was reported at a range of other places. So there is an extraordinary amount of noise that comes in. So I think part of the effort is to differentiate uh, noise and at least to assess the credibility. I mean, there are some cases, for example, where uh, this was certainly true in the transatlantic plot where neighbors 
uh, reported unusual foliage that was dying around a house. Well, it turns out they were building bombs at the uh, house. So uh, in that sense, you know, there are some, there's some information that may come in. It may turn out to be a meth lab. It may turn out to be something else. But there are, you know, there are, uh, you know, there, there are some types of information that I think are a bit more actionable uh, in general. But there is an extraordinary amount of noise, as, you, as, as you're alluding to, that has to be sifted through. Still, with, with, the, with the underwear bomber from 2009, his father reported that his son was radicalizing. I think in that case, you can take that relatively seriously. This is not someone citing uh, at the uh, Circuit City, an Al-Qaeda operative who's in Pakistan. This is a little bit more serious. All right, uh, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you very much for coming. Sir. Thank you.